الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته وعليكم السلام To be honest, and as we say, to keep things real or keep it 100 or keep it 100. Um, coming from the United States, the United Kingdom is famous. Famous and infamous. Both. Fame and infamy. England, London is well known in the United States, rather in the world. But I'm talking about my country and my upbringing. And when you're young, there's so many different things that you see and hear about the United Kingdom, all right? And you oftentimes fantasize about it, whether it's Buckingham Palace, the Queen of England, the Union Jack, Sherlock Holmes, um, uh, James Bond, whatever is famous and iconic, and whatever is related to the United Kingdom, London Fog, it's a popular, uh, Jacket when I was growing up, a trench coat, London Fog, iconic, directly connected to the London Bridge. Okay, Reebok. Reebok sneakers were very popular in the 80s and in the 90s, and obviously, see the color of the English flag or the Union Jack, etc. So, when you're growing up, you hear about the United Kingdom, you see things, you fantasize about things, and you may even dream about things. But when I was younger, it was never ever a dream or a thought that I would come to the United Kingdom to lecture and to speak about Islam and Hadith. And that we would go from city to city, town to town, masjid to masjid, center to center, and you would meet countless, and I literally mean countless brothers, embracing you, welcoming you, asking you questions, thanking you, giving you gifts, and say, Jazakallah khairan, I follow your videos. Jazakallah khairan, I benefit from your channel. Jazakallah khairan, you did this, and so on and so forth. So alhamdulillah, this was something I never thought was going to happen in my life. However, when Allah Azza wa wants to do something, we know that no one or nothing can stop him. And I'm grateful for that, for all of the love, all of the respect, all of the support that all of the brothers and the sisters from the United Kingdom have shown us. We're very grateful for that. Walillahi alhamd. In the United States, when we have our live stream, in the masjid, in Birmingham, London, Leicester, wherever we go, alhamdulillah, we appreciate all of that. May Allah Azza wa reward you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow you to learn beneficial knowledge, whether it's from us or from other than us, and allow you to implement that beneficial knowledge, guide each and every one of you to the straight path, and give you the success for all good in this life and in the hereafter. Allahumma ameen. About a year ago, a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago at most, there was a, um, a brother who came to me in our masjid in Queens. And obviously New York City, just like London, but specifically New York City and Queens is very diverse, very multicultural. You have people there that are of different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different uh, immigrants from different countries, all right? So you have people that are black, people that are white, people that are yellow, and people that are red. You have people from India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, you have black Americans, you have Caribbean Americans, Jamaican, Trinidadian, Guyanese. You have people that come from uh, Jewish backgrounds, Italians, Irish, Hispanics, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rican, Colombian, from El Salvador, all over, let alone the Middle East, Egypt, okay, well, which is not, I don't consider it to be the Middle East. Egypt is a part of Africa. Al Muhim, North Africa, Morocco, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria. Uh, the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, let alone the Far East. You have people there from Turkey, people there from China, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Russia, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, all over, you name it, you'll find in New York City. So, if New York City is diverse and very, very, um, it's interwoven with regards to different races and cultures and religions, then of course that masjid in which you are in New York City is going to be affected by that is going to be affected by that. And the masjid where I, myself, and I'm an imam, there are different races and different ethnicities, and also different Islamic backgrounds. You have people that are pious and righteous, striving, people that are just, you know, barely getting by. You have taxi cab drivers, limousine drivers, 
وهكذا وهكذا so literally in New York City in Queens and specifically in our masjid which is in a very strategically important location on the way to what? John F. Kennedy Airport it's a very strategic location it's not the biggest masjid it's not the fanciest masjid but it's definitely a very important location so you have all types of people that come into this masjid all walks of life so one day I was in the masjid and a brother approached me and I, it looked like he was from Bangladesh so he started talking to me Assalamu alaikum shaykh kif halik blah 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 okay wa alaikum as -salam. he says I have a problem and I need you to help me I said sure he says I'm going through a divorce at the time me and my wife and uh, we have problems we have a daughter so on and so forth and basically he said that my wife has apostated from Islam she's no longer a Muslim I said what happened what's going on he says please can you come to my house and can you talk to her can you give her some speech so on and so on and so on and so forth so what's, what's the problem he said that his wife says that she's still a Muslim but Islam is the submission to God and to God only and the shahada is ashhadu an la ilaha illallah that's it there is no ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah and islam is nothing but the quran there is no such thing as hadith and sunnah there is no such thing as the messenger or the prophet of allah it is only submission to god and to god only that's what he told me i said really he said yes he says and you're the only speaker of all of the different masjids that i've been to that i feel has the ability to get through to her through your knowledge, your eloquence, your English, your young, whatever. Maybe you can talk some sense to her. Can you please help me out? So I asked him some more questions and I went on forth, so on and so on and so forth. So he says that when she prays, she prays to a different direction. She doesn't wear the hijab. She only reads a specific version of the Quran. Rashid, Khalifa, Fulan, they, they follow this group, etc., etc. So I sat down, I said, well, let's see what can be done, inshallah. So one day he took me over his house. Um, he introduced me to his daughter. And he introduced me to his wife, or ex-wife, or she was, yani, bayna manzila, a manzila bayna manzila tain, yani. She was, you know, they weren't divorced, but they weren't absolutely separated, all right? So we started talking, so on and so forth. At the end of the day, it's a very, very, very long discussion that we had, and they had three major problems going on. Problem number one was the problem between husband and wife. Nothing to do with Islam, Iman, Kufr. Them as man and woman. Problem number two, of course, is their daughter and the custody battle that must ensue. Problem number three was the issue of giving da'wah to her to come back to Islam, or what he called the true Islam, etc. So I sat with them and I talked with them, and I tried my best to reason into etc. What happened? Did she come back? That's not important right now. What's important is I left the house. A couple weeks went by. He invited me to come back over again to talk about all three things once more. How do we get divorced? What, does, what do I owe her? What money is due, etc. What are we going to do with our daughter? Who does our daughter follow? Does she pray facing this Qibla or that Qibla? Does she cover her head when she prays or not? Who's, which parent is she going to follow in her religion? And last but not least, can you get her to maybe come back to Islam, etc. So, as the discussion went on, and uh, we talked more and more, uh, he became frustrated. And he lost his temper, he became angry. He became upset and he said, let's go, Sheikh. let's leave. This is a waste of time. You're wasting your time talking to this woman. You're wasting your time. Your time is so precious. You're a Sheikh. you're an Imam. There's so much more that you can do. Let's go. So I said, just, you know, relax, Akhi. Let's, let's see what, what, what can we do. He says, what can you possibly do? He says, we went to the courts. We went to the lawyers and the courts and the lawyers and the people that asked us, what's the problem? Why are you guys fighting? And he said, the, the brother from Bangladesh, he said that the lawyer happened to be a Jew. And in the United States, many lawyers are Jews. It's, it's very well known. Okay, sometimes the best lawyers are Jewish lawyers. I don't know how things are in the United, United Kingdom, but that's what? It's well known in America. Some of the best lawyers are those who are Jewish. So he said to the lawyer, he says, what are you? What's your religion? He says, I'm a Jewish. As you, I'm, a, I'm Jew. I'm Jewish, as you already know. He says, so can you be a Jew? Or what would Judaism be? Or how would you say, what would you say about a person who says that he's a Jew without Moses? I'm a Jew, I believe in this book and that book, but there's no such thing as Moses. I don't have to believe in Moses. Moses never came. Moses was a big fat lie. What would you say? Obviously, the lawyer said, of course not. 
That's impossible. What do you mean? How can someone be a Jew and neglect Moses? That is the kernel, the core of the religion. Is Moses, Musa. He says, then that's my wife. He says, that's my wife. She's saying that she's a Muslim without Muhammad. That's what he said to her. This was, this was his rationale. That's what she's trying to say. Is that you can be a Muslim and submit to Allah without believing, accepting, submitting to, loving, and respecting the Prophet of Islam. Regardless of Quran and Hadith or al muhim Muhammad is not a part of the Quran. He says, he asked the Jewish man, he says, is that, is that possible? And of course the Jewish lawyer, he said, what? No, that will be a huge act of blasphemy and a great waste of time for someone to claim to be a Jew and say that there's no what? There's no Moses. So what's the moral of the story? What's the point that I'm trying to get to? Anyone understand where I'm going or how, or how I'm trying to get there? Anyone understand the moral of the story yet? Anybody? Munkir al-Sunnah. Munkir al-Sunnah. ما يعني إيش منكر السنة ما له تعلق بموضوعنا هذا إيش دخل هذا في ذا يريدون أن أن يأخذوا من شراء الإسلام بس ما هو وجه التعلق بين هذا وبين الموضوع موضوع المحاضرة the prophetic Ramadan أقصد ماذا that you cannot have a Ramadan that's not prophetic there is no such thing as a what? Prophetic Ramadan. That doesn't exist. If your Ramadan is not prophetic, then it's not a what? It's not a Ramadan. As the Jewish lawyer said himself. And how can you claim to follow this religion and the key central figure, you're doing what? Removing. That's just what? A huge, big, fat waste of what? Time. Everyone understand the point? So that's why I'm mentioning this story to you is that there is no such thing as a prophetic Ramadan. It's the Ramadan or nothing. And the same applies to Islam. There is no just Quran. It's Islam. It's La ilaha Allah and Muhammad Rasulullah. And if that's not the case, you have no Islam. He who rejects the Prophet Sallallahu and rejects his hadith and say that Islam is only submission to God has not submitted to God. Everyone understand this? And when his brother told me this and I saw it with my own two eyes, <laughs> It reminded me of a story, a brief incident that I read about when I was going to school in Saudi Arabia. And it was in the early days of Islam, when one of the companions was Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu anhu sat. And he was teaching them what he learned from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi And they told him of a man who says that there's no such thing as hadith, the Quran is enough, you don't need the hadith, we don't have the hadith, etc. Just the Quran. <coughs> So Imran radiallahu anhu, he says, come, come close. He says, come here. And he asked him a few questions. He didn't come down on him, but he asked him some questions. He says, he asked him the basic questions. How do you make salah? What salah do you make? Which direction do you face? How many rakat is maghrib? Do you make tawaf? Awajatta tawaf sab'ar fi kitabillah. Awajatta zakat kedha fi kitabillah. Awajatta salata kedha fi kitabillah. He asked him. He says, Ara'ayta and wukilta anta wa ashabuka ila al-Qur'an. Awajatta fihi salah kada? Awajatta tawaf fihi sabah ashwab? Awajatta, awajatta, awajatta. He says, Ara'ayta and wukilta anta wa ashabuka. He says, if you and your friends, if you and your band, your group, your gang, if you were in charge of the Qur'an, what would Islam be? How many prayers would you find? How many times would you make tawaf around the Kaaba? Which direction would you face? And he asked them all these hard line questions. And obviously the man was dumbfounded. It was no answer that he can give. And Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said at the end of all of that, he said, Ayyukum, khudu anna, wa illam taf'alu, la tudallan. He says, oh you people, take from us, meaning the Sahaba. And if you don't, you will surely be astray. If you don't learn from where we have learned, you will go astray. And in many statements, in many of these mawaqif, these positions that the Salaf and the Sahaba took against those who wanted something that was new and something that was separate than the actual huh, way of Muhammad So with all of that being said, brothers and sisters, the prophetic Ramadan is nothing more than Ramadan based off of the Qur'an. And the Ramadan that is prescribed in the Qur'an is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu prescribed in his authentic Sunnah. As Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, how did the Prophet Sallallahu behave? 
How was his character? How did he conduct himself? She said, and it shows you the beauty of the fiqh of Aisha, anha, how intelligent she was and how much of a great student she was of the Messenger of Allah. And she had short, comprehensive, succinct words. It wasn't a long sentence wasn't needed. A lecture wasn't needed. She said, Kana Khulquhu al Quran. His character was the Quran. That's it. Anything that you find in the Quran, it was Muhammad وسلم, walking and talking. The Quran talks about being brave. The Quran talks about having courage. The Quran talks about being truthful. The Quran talks about being just. The Quran talks about being fair. The Quran talks about treating people how they should be treated. The Quran talks about the orphan and the neighbor. The Quran talks about all of these things. All of that was in Muhammad وسلم, And she didn't need a long, extensive answer. Kana khuluquhu al-Quran. His character was the Qur'an. So the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, that's the only way that we can have a Ramadan. There's no Qur'anic Ramadan. There's no Islamic Ramadan. There's no spiritual Ramadan. There's no cultural Ramadan. The only Ramadan that you could possibly have is prophetic. And if it's not prophetic, then it is if what? Haba'an manthura. Huh? Karamadin ishtaddat bihi rih. Allah speaks about this many verses in the Quran and He gives examples of deeds which are of no use. Three of them. Allah Azza wa Jalla He mentions in Surah Ibrahim. Allah mentions in Surah Tawbah. And Allah Azza wa Jalla He mentions in Surah Al-Nur. Examples and parables or similitudes of deeds of people who have not entered the home through the front gate. People who say that they love Allah we are the children of Allah, wa ahibbahu and his loved ones. Allah talks about haba and manthuran, dust floating in the air. Allah talks about karamad and ishtaddat bihi rih, ashes thrown through a violent wind on a very stormy day. And Allah talks about kasarabin biqia, a mirage in the wastelands, i.e., nothing tangible. So dust that floats in the air when you see the sunlight coming through your window, what value is that? If you took a handful of ash, and it was very, very, very windy, like it is here in the UK, and it was even windier last night, we were in Manchester, or Leicester, it just what? Immediately blows away. And obviously, anyone who's traveled to Arabia, or North Africa, or parts and different regions in which there, there's desert in Arizona, or China, wherever you go, and you're walking, and you're thirsty, and it's extremely hot, you understand the concept of a mirage, something that you think is water, and you keep walking and walking and walking and closer and closer and there's nothing there. Have you ever seen a mirage in real life, anyone? Anyone ever seen a mirage in real life? Maybe on TV, maybe you've read about it in a book or in a cartoon. I remember the first time that I saw one. We were driving from Mecca to Medina, leaving Mecca, passing through Jeddah, and it's so hot, it was so hot outside. So much sun, as you're driving, you see in front of you, looks like water on the road on the hot asphalt. And the more you drive, the closer it looks. And you're driving, you're driving, you drive for four hours, and obviously you don't find any what? You don't find any water. So Allah Azza wa Jalla, He gives us these three examples about the deeds of people who lack Iman. <coughs> the deeds of people who don't have the proper faith. And they may want good, quote unquote. They may want Allah, quote unquote. They may want to do worship, but if it's not done in the proper way, then it is of no use and of no value. So this is what we must understand with regards to Ramadan. There is no Ramadan if it's not the what? I have the what? There's no such thing as that. It doesn't exist. It's either Ramadan or what? Lashay. I would understand that. And if it's not done according to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then it is a month from among the other what? The other months. As it states in other narrations, uh, some of the companions will say, don't allow your fasting just to be hunger and thirst. Don't allow Ramadan to just be a means of you losing weight and that's it. Tayyib, khayran inshallah. So with that being said, for argument's sake, how do we have a prophetic Ramadan? Saying that there is a such thing as Ramadan Nabawi. What do we do to have a correct Ramadan? Or proper Ramadan? Alhamdulillah, I'll say over the last two years, two or three years maybe, um, through my studies and my readings, um, and me traveling and teaching and discussing and so on and so forth, I've come up with what I feel are two of the most important principles 
with regards to Islam in general, the Sunnah and Dawah, and what is the true way of the pious predecessors. And these two principles aren't Tasfiya and Tarbiya, which are very important principles. And we've done lectures on this, Walla and Hamd, explaining the lost and forgotten legacy of Tasfiya and Tarbiya. Tasfiya coming before Tarbiya. But these two principles, I believe that I've come up with them myself. And those principles are spirituality and technicality. Technicality and spirituality. And if you don't have this one-two punch, this salt and pepper, then you're definitely at best deficient. So when we talk about Ramadan, your Ramadan has to be spiritual. Your Ramadan has to be based off of spirituality. That's the fuel that drives your Ramadan. That's the gasoline, the petrol, the engine. But the steering wheel, the GPS, the high beams, the focus of the driver, the thing that allows the petrol to push the automobile and steer it and keep it from danger is technicality. You have to be spiritual and technical, meaning Ramadan has to be something in your heart. Ramadan has to be an issue in which you feel your heart softening. You feel happy. You feel inspired. You feel invigorated. You feel closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. You have a good intention, a good heart. But that's not enough if you don't actually have the technicality. And that is the actual fiqh of Ramadan. What to do specifically. What to avoid specifically. What can I do when I'm fasting? What breaks my fast? How many rak'at for taraweeh? Why am I making taraweeh except for what? Spirituality, right? I could be asleep at night. I have to get up early in the morning. I have to work. I have to eat suhoor. But I pray at nighttime because of what? Spirituality. But now, how do I make taraweeh? Is it 40 rak'at? 20 rak'at? 11 rak'at? 13? What is the ruling of making dua qunut qunut al Do I raise my hands? Can I say it in English? What is to be said in the dua al qunut? Do we do it before rukur? After the rukur? That is the what? The technicality. Are you understand this? That's the actual in the information. So the true dawah has to be based off of these, one, these, these two principles. And you look at many dawahs today, many websites, many dawah organizations, I would say nine out of 10 of them are extremists and zealots and one of the two principles at the expense of the other. We don't need to mention names, names of groups, names of speakers. You find them only focusing on spirituality. That's it. The heart, the soul, the zuhud, the dunya, the dhikr, that's it. Sadaqah, salah, that's it. It's the only thing they talk about. And that's the only thing they push and it's the only thing that they propagate. And you find other groups, the only thing they want to discuss is technicalities. This principle, this view, this hadith, this specific thing, this shaykh, this one, that one. And it's nothing but technical things. And you find the followers having hard hearts. You find the followers, you find the followers of this group or the, this dawah organization having no spiritual attachment whatsoever. And you find them living like shells. The softness, the kindness, the beauty of Islam, it doesn't exist. And they just have a bunch of information in their heads. And very seldom, or seldomly we find someone who has a perfect merging of both principles. There is a such thing as zuhd, yeah. There is a such thing as dhikr of Allah, yeah. There is a such thing as crying over your sins, yes. There is a such thing as divorcing the dunya and taking it out of the hearts of the people, yes there is. But it has to be based off of the authentic hadiths. It has to be based off of the proper understanding. It cannot be based off of culture and feelings and things like this. So technicality and spirituality, that is your guide for a prophetic Ramadan. You have to be spiritual. You have to get closer to Allah. You have to make repentance. You have to free yourself from stinginess and from being a miser in this month. You have to lower your gaze in this month. Stop backbiting in this month. Stop talking about people in this month. You have to get your spirit together, but you, ask, you also have to learn the fiqh of Ramadan. The proper knowledge of the deen. What is the etiquette of suhoor? When is suhoor? Is it before fajr or after fajr? If tar, when the mu'adhan makes the adhan, when he finishes the adhan. What do you eat when you have iftar? Is that hadith authentic? Eating, uh, breaking your iftar with dates. Fresh dates. And if not, then dry dates. And if not, then water. فَإِنَّهُ tahur. Is that authentic? If it is authentic, what does that mean? وَبْتَنَتُ الْعُرُقْ وَتَمَّ الْأَمْرُ وَتَمَّ الْأَجْرُ إِنشَاءَ اللَّهِ 
Is that an authentic hadith? What's the meaning of that? That the reward is tamman ajr. Allah has accepted my fast, inshallah. What does that mean? So the students of knowledge, and the imams, and the scholars, they are the top tier. They are the leaders. They have to set the example for these two guiding principles. Is that we have to learn technically. And our technical knowledge is of no use if it's not for the goal of what? Spiritual development. And spiritual development that's not based off of it, nothing is also of what? It's of no use. And what's the delay from this, you may ask me. And inshallah, I'll talk to me the last thing I want to mention in this lecture today, this short, quick talk that I have with you. Allah Azza wa he tells us, Allah says, It is Allah, Huwaladi. Allah is praising Himself. Allah is lauding Himself. He's telling the people of what He has done for them. Allah is bringing up His favor on them. It is Allah who has sent among the Ummiyeen, the people that were disorganized, the people who were backwards, the people who were, most, in most cases, extremely illiterate, the people that weren't living how they were supposed to be living. He sent from among them a messenger. And what was the job of that messenger? Yatlu alayhim ayatihi. He recited to them his ayat, meaning he delivered the Quran. him, And he cleaned or cleansed them. He washed them. He defiled them. And he taught them the book and the wisdom. <coughs> Even though they were clearly astray before that. And Allah says, And others who have not yet met him and encountered him. Meaning people in the time of the Prophet or Muslims to come later on. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is Al Aziz al Hakim. That is the bounty of Allah to whom He gives, to whom He wills. And Allah Azza wa Jalla is the possessor of the ever expansive bounty. So these verses, it shows us that the duty of the Messenger of Allah were, was divided into three sections. Number one is to deliver the wording of the Quran, to give them the actual Quran itself, and also to make tazkiyah. A word that many people are sensitive about. And if you say the word tezkiyah, so you're a Sufi. If you say the word tezkiyah to nafs, you're this and you're that. And it's mentioned in the Quran. Why you him To make tezkiyah of them. To wash away from them the filth and the sediments of jahiliyyah and of shirk and prejudice and racism and all the things that they suffered from. You him and most importantly, why you alimuhum. And he was to teach them meaning physically. To teach them the book and the wisdom, the book and the sunnah. Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he was of the opinion, and he was of the view, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught the companions the entire Qur'an through tafsir. That every verse in the Qur'an he gave them a tafsir of, every single ayah. Now when you read Ibn Kathir, or Tabari, or Qurtubi, or Alusi, or Ibn Ashur, or Fulan, or Fulan, you say, where's that at? Every verse doesn't have a hadith. And many verses in which there is a hadith for it, a hadith is da'if, it's weak, it's fabricated. How did the Prophet teach every part of the Qur'an to the Sahaba? How is this possible? Shaykh Islam, he says, it's included in his verse. الكتاب. He taught them the tafsir through his actions. He gave them both what? Spirituality. And he also gave them what? Technicality. He taught them what to believe in. He taught them how to believe. He taught them what to reject. He taught them these things. And he also taught them the specific rulings. Do not eat like this. Do not eat with this hand. Do not drink standing up. He taught them technical things. And I think that the world would be a much better place if Muslims themselves understood these principles, let alone non-Muslims understood that Islam is not a book of just spirituality. That's why you find verses in the Quran that talk about warfare. Because warfare is a part of life. As long as there have been human beings, there has been what? Warfare. It's going to be conflict. There's going to be turmoil. So we were in the park today. The guy's holding the translation of the Quran. The Quran is full of murder. Muhammad was a murderer. Muhammad was a warlord. Where does the murder stop in his book? Maybe. 
But I'm living in the United Kingdom. You're a British citizen. How many wars has uh, England fought in? How many? How many countries? How many continents? Because that's a part of what? That's a part of life. That's a part of life. Whether the war is right or wrong, whether it's done correctly or incorrectly, but turmoil and conflict is the nature of the human. The sons of Adam, they did what? They had a, a war. They, had a, they fought. He was jealous and he was angry and he killed him. And there's been bloodshed, what? To this day. So the concept is that the Quran is going to talk about technical things. It's going to speak on using the restroom. It's going to speak on marriage. It's going to speak on divorce. It's going to talk about everything along with the spiritual aspects. And many people, they only want the spirituality of the Quran. Submission, peace, safety, no racism, no prejudice. But they don't want to deal with the technicalities. And it's one of the reasons why they reject the hadiths. That's why they reject the hadiths. Because the hadiths give too much technicality. It gives you a detailed description of how to live from sunset or sunrise to sunset. And they don't want that. They want the vague spirituality of it. And the values that no one in their right mind would reject from the Quran. Peace. Salam. Who will reject that peace? The brotherhood among all nations. Your qabad, your shu'ub. Races and nations. Who won't accept that? That's the modern agenda today. Equality. They want these things. But now what are the details of equality? What are the details of husband and wife? What are the details of this and of that? So that is the true and proper balance with regards to Islam and understanding and in practice. Being the night out, I want to save some time for the questions. Wherever we go, there are always a lot of questions and we never have enough time to answer them. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak. Ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina wa imamina Muhammad. If the sisters have questions, they can send them down on a paper or you can text your husband or your brother or your father or whoever. And if the brothers have questions, then you can either write them on a piece of paper or raise your right hand, not your left hand, inshallah. <laughs> Only raise your right hand. Jazakumullah khayr. Questions will be on the topic or off the topic in the little bit of time that we have. First question says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Advice for the Sunnah knowledge who has tried completing his hifd of the Qur'an for several years but has found barriers preventing him from doing so. Example, lack of teacher, family responsibilities, etc. Should he focus his time on studying other sciences and maintain regular something that I can't see? I don't know him. If you fall seven times, get up eight times. That's what they used to say in ancient Japan. If you fall seven times, get up eight times. So you find it difficult to memorize the Qur'an, keep memorizing. Don't stop. Keep doing it. Is there a hadith or an ayah that says it will be completed in two years? Does the law say the Qur'an will be memorized in five years? Do we, do, we, do we have that? It doesn't say that. That's it. You keep trying. You keep striving. You fall down, you get back up. Be the night Tyler. And as time goes on, maybe you're doing it wrong. Maybe you're doing too much of this, too little of that. Maybe you need a new teacher. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But before you can even get to the maybes, you have to be sure that you're exerting all of your effort and energy. That's first and foremost. Before we say that you're doing it in the wrong way, maybe you're not trying hard enough, or maybe it's not enough time. So if you fall, just get back up. Keep doing it, keep memorizing. Don't stop, don't quit. And that's the advice that we always give to the students of knowledge who find it difficult to memorize or difficult to understand. Or those students of knowledge who have to speak and talk. I can't give the khutbah. Keep doing it. Don't quit. Whatever you do, keep speaking. Keep talking. Don't say, oh, you shouldn't be talking. This brother's older. Yeah, I need nah. Keep doing it. Because the more you do it, the better you will get. And most important is, if you keep doing it, and if you fall down seven times, you get up an eighth time, that shows spirit. That shows tenacity, that you're tenacious and you won't quit. <coughs> and Allah Azza wa Jalla, He loves for His servants to exert themselves. Allah loves this. For the slave to exert himself. And for the slave to fight. And the slave not to quit and not to give up. So that's my advice to that brother or that sister with regards to memorizing the Quran. Keep doing it. Question says, advice please, or advise, for the, advise the person who struggles to develop a habit of reading. Are we understanding this? Same answer. Is you have to what? Keep reading. Don't stop. Don't give in to your nafs. You get tired, you get bored, keep forcing yourself to read. That's the general principle. And the specific answer is, maybe you need to find something that you like to read. 
Maybe you need to find something which is pleasurable or a means of leisure and allow that to introduce you to heavier reading. Maybe you need to be reminded of the necessity of reading, the importance of reading. Maybe you need to hang out with readers, feel shy to play on your phone and people are reading books around you. But before we even go that far, we say just what? Don't stop reading. I would understand this. And we mentioned this, this last night, Ahadus Salihin, one of the righteous people of the past, he said, Jahatu nafsi ala qiyam al sana. He says, I, it took an entire year for me to successfully establish the night prayer. An entire year, over 12 months, just for me to fight myself to pray at night. For dhuqtu halawataha or halawatahu ashirina sana. He says, and I tasted and I enjoyed the sweetness of that prayer for 20 years. 20 years. So you have to try, you have to fight. But if you, get up after, if you give up after six months or four months, you may not win. Maybe it's not that what you're doing is wrong, but it's just not enough time. Keep hacking at the tree, inshallah ta'ala. And if you hack, hack, hack over and over and over again, then maybe you need a, a different hatchet. Or maybe the tree, you need to cut down a different type of tree. But you can't say that until you've exerted what? All of your power in chopping down that tree. That's the mindset of the student of knowledge. And it's one of the most important principles of the hadith disciple school method is the mentality of the student of knowledge not how you look or what you wear or where you come from or who knows you or what's your ethnicity what your skin la how many pens in your pocket means nothing a true student of knowledge begins and ends here a true student of knowledge is how you think and how you look at things and your spirit and your will hmm? should a talib would not try to read non-Islamic literature, is there benefit in this? Of course there is, without a question. No doubt about that. But, or before we even say but, we have to understand something. Every non-Islamic book isn't harmful. And every Islamic book isn't beneficial. There are books that are about Islam which are harmful. Books of dalal, of misguidance. Or, Books that are very beneficial, but they're above your level. There's a great deal of confusion. A great deal of confusion. And you may read something and implement it out of haste, without the proper interpretation, and you may cause a great deal of harm. A great deal of harm. So there are good books written by non-Muslims for you. And there are not so good books written by Muslims that weren't written for you. So benefit is benefit, harm is harm, appropriate or lack of appropriate books, it goes all the way around. So at the end of the day, if you're reading the dictionary, if you're reading the atlas, if you're reading the thesaurus, if you're reading a book of history, and not actually his story, but actual history, sound, tarikh, authentic information, and things like this, that less. And a true student of knowledge who aspires to become a scholar, who aspires to become a debater and so on and so forth, you need these books. Because everyone is not going to come from one aspect or one angle. You have to know about history, religion, you have to know about all of these things. Science, why get that? Let alone the fact that there's nothing wrong with reading a book, even if you read it without the purpose of getting benefit from the book. Unfortunately, a few years ago in the United States, I did a conference, um, and in that conference, however it came up, I mentioned that I like reading books. And I like reading novels and things like this. I said nothing about fiction. A novel could be nonfiction as well. I just said novels. And there was a brother there, very, very sad and unfortunate, an older brother who studied overseas, who's taught classes in America, and he found a problem with that. And of course, it didn't come to me directly through this one, through that one, through that one. How could the brother say this in front of the people? He likes reading English books. He shouldn't say that. Why not? What's wrong with reading an English book? It's not an Islamic book. Is it haram? Is it makru? What's the problem? What's the mushkila? People play basketball. People play video games. People do this. People do that for recreation. So why can't I say my recreation is reading a book? Something which benefits my mind. Or even if it doesn't benefit, it's pleasurable to me. Is it haram to have pleasure in Islam? It's haram to enjoy something in Islam? So, yani, we live in a world in which people, they think and they feel that they got yeah, a very narrow-minded mentality, all right? So that, that's, that's my opinion with regards to reading any book, English, Urdu, Arabic, etc. If it's a benefit for you, if it's good for you, and even if it isn't a benefit for you, is it a harm for you? 
And obviously, reading books is better than doing what? Many other things that people do to pass away time. Huh? Wallahu alam. I've got two questions. They link. Number one is um, for a person, for a to uh, memorize. Um, would you advise him after memorizing Arbaran and Nawiyah to memorize um, Al Mutun al Aimiyah or to go forth to memorize a Hadith al Hakam like Umdat al Hakam? And linking to that question, would you advise to memorize Umdat al Hakam or go straight to Bulugh al Maram? Clear. With regards to the student knowledge, <clears throat> who memorized, Alhamdulillah, 40 Hadiths of Nawi, which is a major accomplishment. If you have that book under your belt, Yani, you have attained a great deal of ilm. And away from your question, brothers who are afraid and scared to do khutbahs or talks or fa'idahs, etc. If you have 40 hadith memorized by heart, there's never ever a time in which you're not prepared for a khutbah. Evident. There's a janazah, please give a reminder. Someone says, please give some da'wah. You can live off of 40 hadith of Nawi. You talk about aqidah, iman, ibadah, zuhd, soften in the heart, death. Kullu is in that book. It's a fihim, khayr al-kathir. A great deal of good just in 40 hadith. And I would advise you and all other disciples of hadith is to make sure that you have a thorough understanding of the book. A good, good, simple, basic understanding. And also stick your nose in Jamir al-Ulum al-Hikam of Ibn Rajab rahimahullah. It's a book that you should read miran wa tikran. Over and over again. And it is actually ism ala musamma. It's a compendium of science and wisdom. So what do you do next? Jamir al-Mutun al or do you go into Bulugh al-Maram or Umdat al-Hakam etc. Well it depends on the student. How far do you want to go? How serious are you? How dedicated are you? How good is your memory? If you feel like that you have longevity, you have the time and you want to do it, take a smaller step. Umdat al-Hakam, and Jami al Mutun al Aliyah is on different topics. So if you just want to memorize the whole book, like, love us. But there's books on Naho in there, books on Aqidah in there, books on this in there. That's not necessarily the order. You understand what I'm saying to you? So, me personally, I would advise, or I would say, due to the lack of time that most of us have, your time overseas is limited, your time here is limited, the responsibilities, and the need for knowledge in our lands go right into Bulugh Muram. Go right into Bulugh Muram. It's a bit bigger, but it's easier, it's simpler, and it's in order. It's in order. Okay, you're memorizing about 500 hadiths from Umm Salakam. It's a benefit, but those hadiths that talk about those fiqh issues, every fiqh issue is not in Bukhari Muslim. So you're going to be lost. Bulugh Muram starts from water all the way to etiquette. In perfect order. Tartib. You see what I'm saying to you? Yani. So, whatever you do, it won't hurt you. It's a benefit from both. If you ask me my personal advice, I would say do that. Unless the jump was too big for you. To go from 42 hadith to 1200 hadith is a big jump. No question about that. But you're not memorizing 1200 or 1300 hadith in full version. You're memorizing Mahal Shahid min al hadith. And Ibn Hajar rahim Allah ta'ala no doubt is Hassan al His pen was what? Was, was sweet. He knew how to summarize the hadith and I'm gonna give you exactly what he wanted. What? From the hadith, along with the takhrij, akhraju al arba, wa bna bi shayb, wa falan, wa falan, wa falan, wa laftu la wa saha wa falan. You see what I'm saying to you? Let alone a service to Bulugh al Maram. How many shuruh can you find? How many lectures can you find? Um to the you can find a few here and there, but nothing like what? Bulugh al Maram, ever then. So it depends. No matter what you do, inshallah, it won't hurt you. Wallahu ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you want to perform i'tikaf in a masjid, there's a mahram have to be present. Jazakallah khairan. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless you. No. Mahram does not have to be in the masjid in which you're making it to Mahram is only needed for traveling. Mahram is needed for traveling. It's not obligatory or necessary to have a mahram in every single place, every single instance. Now, safety, safety is, that's wherever you go. In your house you need safety. In the masjid you need safety. And the bit of reality is, a woman may be safer in, a, in the masjid than her own house. There may be someone who's abusing her, or hitting her, or trying to molest her, or whatever the case may be, in her own house. And she may be safer in the masjid. So safety is a concern no matter what, where you are. Having a mahram in the masjid is not a condition of Ali Atikaf. We can do Islam with a mixture of culture, or we can just do what? Islam. 
my message to husbands and to fathers and uncles, etc. Your daughter goes to college by herself. She gets on a train. How many non-Muslims on a train? How many sinful Muslims on a train? How many righteous Muslims on a train but may be attracted to her? May not lower their gaze. They need to get married. They can't fast. But she can't come to the masjid unless she has a mahram. But the mahram doesn't take her to college or, or uni every day, does he? Of course he doesn't. He doesn't. Yeah, and he's very strange. You find the hypocrisy of many men. They let their daughters or wives go places and do things. No mahram whatsoever. But the masjid, seeking ilm, a class, they say, wait, no, I need to accompany you there. What is this? The house of Allah. So that's not a condition of it to care for Allah. Is it obligatory to make hijrah from the West due to the fitna? If you can't live in the United Kingdom, you can't live as a Muslim, it's a fitna for you, it's a hardship for you to practice the basics of your religion, make hijrah, leave. Go somewhere where the fitna doesn't exist or where the fitna is less. Okay, that's the bottom line. If you can't do it, if you feel like it's a hardship on you, your kids are going to be corrupted, then leave. Put your trust in the law and go to where you feel that you can make hijrah towards. That's the bottom line. As far as thinking that there are countries which are free from mistake, free from problems, void of issues, only Allah knows does that exist in 2019. You go make hijrah, you run from five problems, and you may encounter ten problems. You may run from this religious issue and you find another religious issue. All right? Al-Muhim is that it depends on the person. Me personally, as a person, I do not feel that it's obligatory for everyone to make hijrah. Some people need to make hijrah. Some people have to make hijrah. No question about that. Every single Muslim, I don't necessarily believe that. I believe that there are some Muslims who need to and have to stay in these lands. But that's not every single person. Wallahu alam. It says our intent, our internet. Can you read this, Noor? <coughs> oh, oh, interest-based loan, haram, in all in, in all circumstances. Yeah, especially housing. Our interest-based loans, haram in all circumstances, especially housing. Do not take any loan that involves interest unless it is a necessity. House, car, college, whatever the thing is. Don't do it. Stay away from it. Avoid it unless it is a necessity. And Allah knows best. What is the correct approach to takfir and tabdir? And when is the excuse of ignorance no longer valid? For Muslim and non-Muslim alike. A very important question. Uh, and I admire the question a lot. Whereas the questioner mentioned these two things together. Which oftentimes they should be mentioned together as a pair. Takfir and tabdir. And it lies no doubt. And the truth is said. And the truth never has to apologize. We are very extremely hypocritical beings. Extremely hypocritical. The people are lax. Making tabdi is like what? Bismillah. <sighs> Drinking a cup of water. Takfir? No, 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 no. no. La, 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 la. We don't make takfir, brother. That's not the way of Ahlul Sunnah. There is no takfir. He's a takfiri. It's a takfiri masjid. They're takfiri you. They're this, they're this, or that. But tabdi is what? Cup of water. Correct or incorrect? Sahlala. Tabdir, anyone can do it. Anyone can make it easily. He went here, he did this. Mubtadir. Sheikh Fulan said he's a Mubtadir. What's the delay of Sheikh Fulan? I don't know, but he's a Mubtadir. Tabdir is simple, but takfir is extremely taboo. Anybody can make tabdir, only a scholar can make takfir. Sheikh Hassan bin Taymir, what did he say in his famous statement? Edna tabdiha. He said that Tabdi, the, 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 the clearance of an innovator is a what? The sister of Takfir. Lish, Ishma and Adel Kiram. Okay, if you go on Ukhtar Takfir, Lishma and Akhul Takfir. Ishma and Adel Kiram. Ishma and Adel. When you read in Aqid al Wasatiyah, 
and let on the bigger books of Sheikh Hassan Taymiyyah, you see Bab al Asma'i wal Ahkam, names and rulings. Names being Muslim, Mu'min, Muhsin, Kafir, Munafiq, Fasiq. That's Asma'ah. And the Ahkam of Iman, Islam, Ihsan, Kufr, Fisk, Nifaq, Ibtida', etc. Al Asma'ah wal Ahkam are what? They're linked. They're what? They're linked. And that's because it's a branch of Iman. Declaring someone a Mu'min, declaring someone a Kafir, you can't understand the way of the Khawarij unless you understand the way of Ahl Hadith, of what is Iman, what isn't Iman, and what does Iman do? Does it go? Does it fall? Is it one piece? Etc. So the people there lax with Tabdir. There's no doubt about that. But Takfir? No, 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 no. They'll never think about it. And that is very what? Hypocritical. And that's because the mustard of those two things is what? Wahid. And that's Bab al Asma'i wa Ahkam. Let alone what Ibn Taymiyyah himself said. What Ibn al Qayyim said. What Muhammad ibn Dhuhab said. What the ulama what? Said regarding these things. So at the end of the day, if you're going to make tabdir, if you're going to make takfir, so be it. As long as it's based off of clear, sound knowledge from Quran, Sunnah, and Al Ijma. The Kitab, the Sunnah, and Ijma. Let that be your source for whatever you're saying about someone else. Bottom line, if you don't have that knowledge of the Kitab, the Sunnah, and the Ijma, if that's not your level of knowledge, then avoid Tabdeer, Takfir, Tafsiq, Tadlil, Kulluha. That's the bottom line. But we can't mix and match and do what we want to do. Tabdeer is okay, Takfir is a no no. Takfir is alright, but there's no such thing as Tabdeer. Only the ulama can make takfir, but anyone can make tabdir. It's not a circus, guys. Are we understand this? It's not a play. It's not a musical. It's not a merry-go-round. It's not a game. This is a science. It has rules. What did, he, what did he say? Very what? Very old rules. And those rules have to be followed and obeyed. You can't pick something and put something down on your fancy. I don't like you, so there's tabdir. But this person is a takfiri. Okay, he has his proof to make takfir, and he has it. you have your proof for tabdir. Who's right, who's wrong? So that's my advice, is to stay busy with beneficial knowledge. To stay beneficial with righteous action. To stay, to, to stay busy with what? Righteous action. To stay busy with da'wah. And if you're qualified for that, scholar, student of knowledge, al-muhim, qualification, and there's a need, and there's a reason, then that's one thing. If you're not qualified, if there isn't a need, if there isn't a reason, and if you're not being busy and staying busy with those things, then obviously we know what's going to happen, and that's extremely problematic. Everyone understand this? Wallahu Next question says, is it far to wear jilbab? Is it okay if I wear a loose abaya and scarf that covers me, or do I have to wear a jilbab starts from my head and covers the shoulders? No, it's not obligatory to wear any type of clothing or any style or culture of dress in the kitab and in the sunnah and the ijma to cover yourself whether it's from your shoulders or your head al-muhim is you cover yourself a woman can wear an abaya that falls on her head down to her feet and she can wear something under it which the wind blows her body is seen or it could be transparent or it could be tight or it could be a bad fabric or 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 and a woman can wear an overgarment that's on her shoulders and a long khimar and her body is covered better than the one wearing the abaya. Does Allah Azza wa Jal hal ta'abbadun Allah Azza wa Jal did Allah place this upon us as worship? Is there a hadith that states that? Min al katifain? Is that in the Quran? Is that consensus of the Salaf al Salah that it has to be from the head and not the shoulders? If it's not, then we go back to the meaning and the wisdom, and that is sitr, covering. So as long as her body is covered, it's loose, it's not transparent, it's not perfumed, it's not like a man, etc. That's hijab shari. And if it does hug her body, if it's transparent, if it's perfumed, if, 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 then that's hijab ghair shari. Is it obligatory to fall from the shoulders? Bring the kitab, bring the sunnah, bring the ijma. And if you don't have those three things, then we say, Jazakallah khairan, that's your view, that's your ijtihad, that's the fatwa of Shaykh Fulan, tayyib, la bas. Like in that tourism and that's we have the code. Don't force that upon the people. And saying that this has to be, and there's no concrete evidence to support that. Ishtihadat, umumat, generalities, Arab culture, they had the jilbab from the head, minjalabi bihinna, etc. Mashi. 
ممكن maybe بغيري إلزام don't force it upon the people and if it was my daughter or my wife or my sister or my mother I would not make it a requirement that the garment has to hang from the head no we don't agree with that والله أعلم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاك الله خيرا for the beneficial lecture number one how to control anger number two how to increase khushu and salah number three how to know whether a some speaker is truthful upon the correct methodology may Allah bless you as well how to control anger ask Allah to protect you from your anger read those verses in the Quran on which Allah praises those who control their anger one cow we mean Allah says those who suppress and stifle their anger meaning it's a reward for them read the words of the Prophet don't become angry after the man asked him for advice, O Sini, O Sini, O Sini, the only thing that he said, don't become angry. And there's a wisdom behind that. Al Hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah in Fatul Badi, uh, he quotes from some of the ulama who say that one of the wisdoms of avoiding anger and staying away from anger is that anger is a manifestation of pride, it's a manifestation of kibbah, it's a manifestation of arrogance. And the proof for that is if there was a man who had an anger problem, and let's say that the man was five feet and five inches tall. And there was a man who stood in front of him was seven feet tall. How angry would he get in front of him? How angry, how bad would he lose his temper? It's a big, 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 big guy. But let it be a man who's only five feet tall or a woman who's only five feet tall. He would, what? Explode in anger and rage. But he wouldn't get that angry when someone was two, three times bigger than him. Because he knows that he can push and bully this person around who's smaller than him, so he's angry. He manifests his what? His pride and conceit in himself. But he's looking up here. He's going to think twice before he becomes angry. And that is the case of most bullies, if not all of them. They bully people that they can bully and push around. But the moment, like we saw today in Hyde Park, when they see someone that they can't bully around, they want to be peaceful and yeah, they turn the other cheek. Uh, it's the reality. So anger is evil. And it's one of the easiest ways that the shaitan enters upon you through ghadab, through anger. So these are ways of controlling it and obviously practice makes perfect. Number two, or last but not least, my last piece of advice is, is make sure that you have someone with you, a friend. Give them, tell them, listen, do me a favor. When you see me become angry and lose my temper, I want you to take a picture and a video of me. Don't ask my permission. I start cursing and throwing things around. Take all of the footage of me getting angry. Sit down. Watch the video. Look how ugly you look. I guarantee it's going to make you say, wow, that was me. I said that. I did that. I punched that. I threw that down. I broke that. I stuck for the law. You're not going to be pleased how you look when you're in that moment of rage. So reflect upon that. Reflect upon that. How to increase khushu in the salah? Learn the Quran. Learn the Arabic language. Read the tafsir of the Quran. Understand the words of Allah. Understand what's being said to you. When Allah is speaking to you, when Allah is talking to you, He's telling you about this one and that one and this story and this reward and this punishment. Learn the Lugh al and learn the Tafsir. That's a very important way of, or easy way of obtaining khushu and the Salah. Number three, how do you know a speaker is truthful and upon the correct methodology? Number one, sincerity. Number two, common sense. Number three is by you knowing the fundamental basics. That is a tremendous stepping stone to reaching certainty or knowledge of who should I learn from and who what I should not learn from. That's in brief. Is it haram to take a student loan with riba even if you don't pay it back because you may not cover the go over the threshold or pay back the loan amount in 30 years left alone, let alone the interest that accumulates on the loan? Once more, do not take an interest-based loan unless it is a necessity. Unless it is a necessity. Period. And even, even when it is a necessity, it's very dangerous. If you read non-Islamic books, books of kuffar, people who are not Muslims, you'll be shocked what you'll find about what they say about usury and interest and the history behind it. 
and what Jews say about it, and what Christians say about it, and what's supposed to be in their scriptures about usury and interest. And you read things of modern economic specialists about the danger of riba and the harm of riba and how destructive riba is and how it creates modern slavery. A virtual electronic chain and ball. A virtual chain and ball. You go to school to be a doctor, how long do you have to pay off that debt? Buying a house, buying a car, getting married, every bill that comes in. Do we realize this, guys, that we're always in debt 24-7? People, they ask the question, can you make Hajj if you have a debt? Can you make Umrah if you have a debt? Can you make, can you go in the lost cause if you have a debt? Can you seek it if you, we're, we, 24-7 we're in debt. And that's because of right now. The light's on. What does that mean? That is a what? There's a bill. There's a debt. There's a cycle. So you have so much debt, so much slavery. Do you need this big, gigantic house? Do you need this brand new car, this type of car? Do you need this? The only way you can get an, uh, a job through this degree, through this university? How long do you want to be a slave of the system? So be mindful of that. Allahu alam. Next question says, we're running out of time. I'm so sorry for rushing through these answers. What's the right and wrong thing to do in Ramadan? The right thing to do is to study and to read. And to take the example of the Prophet who made the clear message what to do in Ramadan. Fast, pray, charity, itikaf, and most importantly, control your tongue. That's the madhab of salaf is to control your tongue. Fasting, leaving off food and drink is easy. Backbiting, slander, gossip, that's the difficult thing. That's what you should do in the month of Ramadan. Allahu Adam. I never have the energy to pray properly. And I can't focus on hiv, etc. work. What should I do? Ask Allah to protect you from the evil of yourself. And ask Allah to protect you from the evil of jinn and of men. Read the Quran upon yourself. Make the adhan. Listen to the adhan. Read Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, every single day in your house. Don't go to sleep unless you have wudu. Don't go to sleep unless you make tawbah. Connect yourself with Allah. Remain positive. Stay in the company of good Muslim friends. And do not be by yourself if you don't have to be by yourself. You need to be with someone all of the time. Wallahu alam. Which books would you recommend of a student knowledge to start with prior to seeking knowledge in Medina, Egypt? I don't understand the question. If you're a student of knowledge, What's prior to seeking knowledge? Except for what I just explained of the backwards philosophy that a student of knowledge is only in Egypt. A student of knowledge is only in Medina. That's wrong according to our method. A student of knowledge is in London. Before you get on the airplane to go to Egypt, you're supposed to be a what? Yeah. Student of knowledge. <laughs> you know no Arabic. You're supposed to be a what? Yeah. Student of knowledge. It's a mentality. Everyone understand this? How you look at yourself, how you conduct yourself, how you hold yourself. Everyone understand this or not? And I'm telling you right now, you're asking me a question. I'm sitting in front of you. If I wasn't a student of knowledge in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, before Medina, I wouldn't be here today. And there would be no Hadith disciple. If I waited to go overseas to become a student of knowledge. Student of knowledge is where you are right now. So there's no such thing as prior. Now, of course you mean student of knowledge, student of knowledge, overseas. There are levels of Tulab al You can study for many years out your life and be a Tulab al-Ilm. There's always someone who's more knowledgeable, who's learning. There's always someone who has greater hymn. So there's no such thing as prior, all right? If you want to know what books to read, what books to study, what teachers to have, please go to the many, many, many classes that we have devoted on Hadith Disciple just to this question. It is an entire playlist just on this question about being a student of knowledge, so on and so forth. Well, would you, how would you define what you mean by necessity with regards to interest-based loans? There's no definition of necessity. Necessity is always relative and subjective. One person says, it's a necessity for me to do it. Another one says, it isn't a necessity. I have to go to college and get a job and take care of my parents and get married. I can't live like this. I can't do this. I can't work here. It's a necessity. I won't be able to function. Maybe. But for the next brother or the next sister, he says, I don't have to do that. I can go to a vocational school and get a trade. 
I can go to a smaller college and get the degree without the RIBA loan. Well, how can that? So that's, that's, that's from person to person. What is necessity is based off of person to person. Are there general Islamic principles? Of course. And what your person fears, yakshatalaf. He fears death. That's definitely a necessity. He fears bala, yalhaquhu, harm. That's necessity. But even that, that's relative. A person says, we're not going to die, we'll be all right. And another person says, I'm going to die. That's from person to person. At the end of the day, be honest with yourself. In tastuqillah, yasduq. If you're truthful with Allah, that's what you will receive, inshallah ta'ala. You know what is necessity, and you know what isn't necessity. You know how much sabr you have, and how much sabr you don't have. Hmm? Allah Azza wa knows best. If it wasn't for the lack of time, we would try to sit here and answer your questions to the best way we know how. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry that we have to leave. Uh, there are many other places and locations that we have to go to. It was my pleasure to come here and to speak with you and discuss these things with you. Jazakumullahu khairan. Hopefully it won't be the last time that we get to meet, inshallah.